Okay, welcome to the lecture on microphones. This will be part two of my lecture about how to choose microphones, patterns, and placement. Uh, just to review, the first lesson was about microphone types, and I'm going to bring in uh, really nice information from Sweetwater, which is included in this lesson. I'm going over dynamic mics. Here they're showing the SM58, the most common dynamic mic. Uh, used for a lot of applications. It's very versatile, used for live sound a lot. Condenser mics, which are more sensitive, they work on a capacitor principle. They need 48 volts DC to charge up the capacitor. They're used in a studio situation generally. Ribbon mics have a small element that's called a ribbon. It it's, um, picks up sound very accurately, but since it has a ribbon versus a con versus a capacitor, the ribbon um, does not accentuate shrilly sounds as are commonly used on trumpets um, because they can handle that sound pressure level, that high sound pressure level from instruments like that. And another microphone, one that I use a lot with my laptop if I'm out in the field is USB microphone. You plug it in and the USB microphone kind of becomes your studio. Mine has a plug-in for headphones and volume and a mix for headphones and for the overall volume and uh, it's super convenient and they sound really good. So now we're going to go over polar patterns and what those mean. So all microphones have some type of polar pattern. Um, actually I'm going to start with this one here, cardioid. So this is if you're following along, along slide 17. The SM58, for example, shown here, and dynamic mics mostly have this pattern, cardioid. It's named cardioid after heart-shaped. And what happens is, with this microphone, you hear mostly what's right in front of the microphone. And what's behind it, um, where you see that heart indent, is rejected. So uh, when you hold the mic by your mouth, you're hearing the front, and you're not hearing the back which is great because if you're standing by, for example, monitors or loud audience or whatever, you don't have feedback there. Um, these are really great for a live sound. Um, and they're also used in the studio where uh, the back side of the mic where you're holding it with your hand is cutting out any sound coming in from that side. Also, uh, this microphone um, will have an proximity effect that we'll talk about in a minute, which is increased bass response when the mic is held very close to the sound source. Another microphone characteristic that you'll see a lot on the switches on condenser mics is omnidirectional. So this microphone pattern detects sound equally from all directions. So that's why it's represented as a circle, and when you see this on a microphone, you'll see a little circle icon when you, when you use your microphone switches. These are really great for capturing room sound along with whatever else you're recording. If you have a great room sound and you're recording a vocal and it's very quiet, you can use an omnidirectional in that situation. If you're, um, if you're recording like an entire orchestra, that would also be a good application of an omnidirectional mic pattern. Another mic pattern is figure eight. Uh, it's also called that figure eight polar pattern is where it's equally sensitive to sound picked up from the front and back of a of a capacitor mic or condenser mic and rejects sounds coming from the sides. So to be more clear, the there's a if the microphone is square, the flat sides or the larger sides are the ones where it picks up. The thinner edges are where it doesn't pick up. The important thing when using this mic, um, this bi-directional mic, is to make sure that um, you're facing the sides of the microphone that are picking up the sound. So some situations where you can use this is in between two players in an orchestra, in between two singers doing a duet, in the middle of a barber's shop quartet. So it's situations where you're sharing a microphone and recording something at the same time. Really nice for that. Some other mic patterns, um, you can buy micro dynamic microphones like this and also switches on condenser mics are the supercardioid and hypercardioid patterns. And those um, are more directional. So let's say you're 
you're um, in a section and maybe you have somebody loud next to you, um, you can use a supercardioid or hypercardioid to just record right to, what's right in front of the microphone and reject more sound next to, next to it. However, you do get more sound from the back side of the mic. As you can see here, it's a little bit different looking than the cardioid microphones. So another important thing to know about microphones is they all have a certain frequency response, somewhere between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. And I have a, some notes here that a vocal mics uh, record a little lower, or a vocal, I'm sorry, instrument mics record a little lower than vocal mics. And um, they basically, where they record well is, is relating to what type of thing you want to record. So vocal mics would record well in that 400, 800 hertz range. Bass mics, something that would record a kick drum, would record really well under 100 hertz, for example. Um, I'll show you a pattern right here. This is the frequency response of an SM57, an instrument mic. It records down here at 50 hertz, actually 40, and then for pretty flat and accurate frequency response up to um, about 5,000 hertz, and then it accentuates the high sounds a little bit above that. So all of the mics that you look at, you can look at the specs for those and see what the frequency responses of that microphone and what types of uh, instruments that the manufacturer recommends. In this case it says this is a great microphone for snare drums and it's also great for guitar amplifiers. Proximity effect, I like to think of this effect as when you're a radio announcer and you want to sound a lot bigger than you are or as an announcer at a ball game you put your sound source or your mouth uh, less than an inch from the mic capsule and it accentuates that bass response. So a lot of microphones, especially handhelds, will have that proximity effect. So sometimes you want it, of course, and sometimes you definitely don't. Transient response is how quickly a mic reacts to the sound. You can think of this, for example, in cymbals. You want a small microphone with a small head so that you have that fast transient response that condenser mic that's already charged up. Um, you don't want a slow, big diaphragm mic to record something that, where you need quick transient responses. Okay, line level versus mic level. This comes into play when you're plugging in equipment from one thing to another. Um, in fact, you'll see it on amplifiers and on A to D converters. Um, so you have line level and mic level, and you need to know it, there's usually a switch or a different plug when you're plugging things in. Uh, whether you're doing or you're whether you're plugging in a piece of equipment or an instrument that's operating at line level or mic level. So um, there's the ratings: line level of minus 10 dB or plus 4 dBm. The best usually it's marked on your equipment on uh, whether something is line level or mic level. But basically, a microphone's at mic level, it needs to be brought up to line level, um, and that's why it, there's a, um, a different circuit in where you plug it in. Then if something's already at line level, you don't need to reboost it again. If you're overloading, you get too much signal on your microphone, you're going to get distortion, and it just sounds bad. It's really not fixable. So when you're recording, make sure you look at your meters and you get up to the top of the green, if it starts going in the yellow, that's okay. If it starts going red where you're distorting, you're just going to record. Um, it basically sounds like clipping and you get distortion and it does not sound good. On microphones that are condenser microphones, you can use a mic pad on those. There's a little switch. It usually says minus 5, 10, 15, or 20, and that lowers the sound pressure coming into the microphone. So if you have something super loud, those pads are really convenient. Mic impedance is the load that a mic can drive in ohms, and um, there's also uh, high impedance mics. You might have seen those where you, they're a little rectangular looking. You can put them um, on a guitar, acoustic guitar, and um, the, the longer the cable, the more noise that picks up, so that's why there's a cable length um, of 25 feet is the maximum. The low impedance mics are what we use in the studio. They operate between 50 and 250 ohms. You can use very long cables in those, in fact, daisy chaining cables, um, and run those all over the studio with no noise. 
connections. So connections are super important. We'll start with the unbounced connections. These have uh, a tip and a sleeve. And uh, you'll see two types there, tip and a sleeve, which is a TS connector. And there's a diagram there. You'll see those on, let's see, in my studio right now. Looks like I have one. My headphones are TRS, meaning they're in stereo. TS would be like a guitar cable, for example. Um, so those um, are balanced mono signals. And then a balanced connector would have a third, a tip ring and a sleeve. So like in headphones, when you're listening in stereo, you need that uh, bounce connection. And then you see an XLR connection, which is three pins. That's what your connections look like to microphones and some speakers. So some speakers use the TRS plug, and some of them use the XLR, just depending on the design in the back. Okay, these are some things um, about microphones that you need to know, um, what the difference in these things are. The windscreen on the microphone is when you have foam over a microphone. Um, those windscreens are just like what, if you're using a microphone outside. The wind um, basically ruins a recording, as you'll hear when you listen to news on a windy day. Um, so um, outdoor microphones many times come with those. Whereas a pop filter, that's not a windscreen. That is a flat, in fact, I'll bring one up um, so you can see what it looks like, filter. So here's a pop filter. This goes in front of the microphone, and when you sing or talk and you use S, P, T, those are called plosives, and that windscreen will make those sound um, better when you're recording. A shock mount, that's the thing that holds the microphone, like uh, sensitive microphones like a condenser microphone, so that it's, those type of microphones you can't hold them when you're recording or, or it'll just make a lot of noise and you wouldn't want that. So I'll bring up a shock mount here. There's a shock mount where the microphone sits in there and it's suspended with these rubber bands and then you connect this to the mic stand. So the microphone's suspended with the shock mount. The microphone preamp, sometimes you have microphones um, that take more power like the tube mics and they'll have a separate preamp, but that's the amplifier that provides power to a condenser mic. In phantom power, that's your 48 volt DC switch that you'll have um, in order to power up the capacitor on a condenser microphone. Now mic placement is um, a big subject because where you place the mics is going to affect the quality of your recording. So three to one rule um, means you want to have your mic um, three times the distance for the sound and I'm going to, because I get that backwards, I'm going to actually read what the three to one rule is about. Um, when using two microphones to record a source, normally you will get the best results by placing the second mic three times the distance from the first mic. Three to one rule. Okay, so what does that mean? That comes into play when you have something like drums. If the microphones are very close together, you're going to basically get the same sound in both microphones, so you won't be able to mix well later on. So that three to one rule, if a microphone is one inch from your snare head, then the next microphone needs to be at least three inches away from that mic to record something different. If your microphone then is far away from the sound source, like a foot away, and the next microphone is not more than three feet away, it's going to record the same information. Ambient mic mics or room mics are really important so that you can have that room tone in your recording and have access to that. Especially um, in film is a good situation where if you're recording a dialogue on a set and you have that those room mics, and then somebody needs to re-record something because they messed up a line or they changed a line, um, if you record it in a different studio, for example, or a different space, you're going to need to add that room tone in on another track behind the recording or it'll just sound totally weird. So ambient mics adding room tone. Um, stereo mics are mics that are usually in the front of the room at a 95 or 135 degree angle from each other. And you'll 
that provides recording of an entire room. Those are common, for example, stereo miking in orchestra or a large band. Then direct recording in a DI box. That's where I use it a lot for guitars, where I plug my guitar in the DI box and the DI box into the mixer or A to D um, converter. What that does is it takes that guitar level signal and brings it up to line level signal um, in the direct box without having introducing any noise. So, and I always carry one around as well in case I have like a grounding issue somewhere or I need to put it between, for example, my bass guitar and my amplifier. And um, it takes that signal and takes any noise out of it as well. In the lesson also I've put a lot of information about how to select mics and what types of instruments work on different microphones. So you can look at that. And uh, it's a little bit about microphone, polar patterns, choosing mics. It's a large subject. The only way to really learn it is start using them and start watching other people use them. See how they're used, how they're placed, practice it. And, um, and then pretty much that's how you learn about microphones.